3 is where we are in our ongoing study of the book of Romans, and we're going to dive into the middle of a debate that is going on in Romans chapter 3. This section of Scripture, there is a debate going on where the old Paul is debating the new Paul. Paul is having a debate with himself. It's actually the old Pharisee uh, Paul, the old rabbi-trained Jewish Paul is debating the new born-again redeemed Jesus follower Paul on the question of the importance of Jewishness. What does it matter? Is there any benefit to you spiritually if you were born a Jew and if you grew up an observant, obedient Jew? Does that have any benefit? I'll tell you at the beginning who wins the debate, okay? It's the Jesus Paul who wins the debate, not the Jewish Paul. Uh, this, but but Paul is is really he, he knows the the issues in this debate because these were the same issues he had to wrestle with when he moved from Judaism to becoming a Christ follower. When he moved from being a Pharisee to becoming a Christian, he used to persecute who he is, and so he is answering objections that he had to deal with in his own life. And it's a little tricky to follow what's going on in these first eight verses. Of, uh, of Romans 3, but I hope we can do that this morning. Here's, here's the context for this debate. In Romans 1 and 2, Paul has been laying out a clear and compelling case for the fact that everybody needs Jesus. Everybody needs the gospel because everybody has a sin problem. In Romans chapter 1, he says the Gentiles need Jesus because they have an obvious morality problem and they it's clear that that uh, they need to repent and to come to Jesus. And the Jews are saying, you nailed them, Paul. But then he gets to Romans 2 and he says, oh, by the way, you have a sin problem too if you're a Jew. The fact that you have the law, the fact that you practice circumcision, these are not sufficient for you to find favor in God's sight. You need Jesus just as much as the Gentiles do. And the Jewish readers did not like that. But again, because Paul was once himself a moral, faithful, circumcised Jew, he knew how his readers would respond to that charge. And so he is now in Romans 3 saying, I know you've got... Good debater does. If you're ever in a debate, if you're ever in a discussion with somebody, one of the things you need to make sure you do is after you have laid out what, what is your case, what's your belief, what's your conviction... Then you need to get around on the other side of the room. study it, you are using your word in the hand of your spirit to change us into the image of your son. Thank you most of all that in your word we come to know you. That's why we love your word, because we love you and your word leads us to you. So please give us ears to hear this morning and hearts to obey as we hear your word today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Romans 3, I'll read verses 1 through 8 from the English Standard Version of the Bible. You follow as I read aloud. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what's the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. But what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though every one were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our understanding, or excuse me, if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak 
in a human way. But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why follow Jesus, so what about all these promises God made to us? And the third objection is, how can God punish Jews if their rejection of him ultimately brings glory to him? Isn't the purpose of life to bring glory to God? So if by rejecting Jesus I bring glory to God, how can he punish me? Because I... Three objections. Let's look at each one of those. The first one comes right out of what Paul has said at the end of Romans 2, he has he spelled out the fact that a Jew, being a Jew, does not guarantee you entrance into the kingdom of God, and that the covenant sign of circumcision is no guarantee that you're going to get into heaven. So he imagines somebody saying, well, if being a Jew is not going to get us into heaven, what advantage is there to being a Jew? And if circumcision doesn't guarantee our salvation, why should we have that procedure done, right? And his answer is right there, the, the question's in verse 1 then what advantage has the Jew or what is the value of circumcision? That's objection one. Are you saying, Paul, that keeping the law and our faithfulness to the covenant sign of circumcision are empty and meaningless? Is that what you're trying to tell me? And what is the good of being God's chosen people if it doesn't guarantee heaven? And his answer in verse one is that there is much value in every way. So being a Jew has benefit and has value. There is much value in every way. There is keeping the law and being circumcised are still good things. It has great value, but it doesn't have saving value. They thought it had value that it doesn't have. And they're saying, because it doesn't have the value that we thought it had, does that mean it's no good? And he's saying, no, there's still value there. It's just not the value you thought it was going to have. There are a lot of ways to illustrate this. Let me, let me give you a few. Um, and and the, the point is, just because something doesn't have the value you thought it was going to have doesn't mean it's valueless. So here's an illustration. I, because of all of the travel I do, I am a frequent flyer, and my airline of choice is American Airlines. The reason it's my airline of choice is because my brother-in-law is a test pilot for American. He flies, and so this is in the family. I have a family obligation to fly American as often as possible. And I have flown more than 1.2 million miles on American Airlines in my lifetime. I am lifetime gold on American Airlines, which has very little value, okay? <laughs> it means I get free a free bag when I fly on American because I'm lifetime gold. However, last year I flew enough that I got bumped up to platinum. Now, before you go get think that that's pretty special, there are five there are five uh, status categories for American Airlines and I'm at number 4, okay? Gold and platinum, gold is number 5. Platinum's number four. Then there's new Platinum Pro. Then there's Executive Platinum. And then the highest level is the Concierge Key. So, so what this means, the fact that I'm Platinum, means that I get not only the free check luggage, but I'm in group three when it's boarding time. <laughs> now, there are nine groups. I'd rather be group three than group nine. I get access to the overhead space before you normal people do, okay? <laughs> so it's a nice thing that I get that. It, it also means that I can sit, you know how now in the back part of the plane, the front part of the back part has a little extra leg room? 
I can sit up there for free. Nanny, nanny, nanny. Okay, all right. So there are perks, and if, if I'm flying less than 500 miles, which basically means here to Dallas, if I'm flying there, and if they haven't sold tickets in first class, I get up there. Okay, yeah, so are you impressed? Now, I want you to imagine with me this, moment, this morning that I called American, and I said, uh, I'd like to book a flight to Rome. And I gave them all the dates and the times. I want to go round trip to Rome. And they got back and they said, we, we got you all taken care of. It'll cost $1,500. And I said, well, I'm platinum. Well, they would say, yeah, we see that in your record and we've got you the preferred seating and the baggage thing and you'll get extra points for your flight as a result, but it's still $1,500. And I would say, well, wait a minute. I'm, I'm platinum and I still have to pay? I'm a frequent flyer. They would think I was crazy if I said that. Now, here's the point. Being platinum has some benefit to it, but I still got to pay to get on the plane. Being Jewish has benefit, but it's not the benefit that gets you into heaven. You see? That's the point Paul's making. Here's another example. How many of you have a spice rack in your home? Most of us have. If you don't have a spice rack, you've got a shelf where the spices are, right? And so you've got all of those spices up there. Well, let's say that I came to your house for dinner, and I said, man, I'm looking forward to dinner. I am starved. And you said, well, let's see what we've got. And you took me to the spice shelf. And you said, you can have any of this that you want. <laughs> right? You help yourself to any of these spices you would like. And I would go, this, is not, this is no, does not help me to have these spices. It's not going to, there's no benefit. It's not going to solve my hunger. Now, does that mean the spices are worthless? No. They add flavor. They add benefit to the food. But they're not good for what I need at the moment. Here's a final illustration. Let's say that your goal in life, you're like Stephen McBride, and you want to be a Supreme Court justice in the United States one day, okay? You want to be one of the nine up there. And so your goal is to be a Supreme Court justice. Would, it be, would you be better off going to Harvard or the University of Missouri at Kansas City? if you want to be a Supreme Court Justice. Now, the reason I picked University of Missouri at Kansas City is, first of all, I was accepted into their law school. I did not attend, but I was accepted into the law school. So anybody can get into the University of Missouri at Kansas City. The other reason I picked it is because one Supreme Court Justice in history was a graduate of UMKC. Our 20 Supreme Court Justices in history were graduates of Harvard, including six of the current nine, including the current chief justice. The other three are from Yale. So apparently, there is an advantage, if you want to get on the Supreme Court, to going to Harvard over going to UMKC. But going to Harvard doesn't guarantee that you're going to be on the Supreme Court one day. It just gives you a leg up over the people who went to the Bowen School of Law at UALR. So the, the point that Paul is making is just because being a Jew doesn't have saving benefit, it doesn't mean there's no benefit at all. You have been trusting your Judaism to make you right with God, Paul says. That's not what it was designed for. So if those things don't save you, the Jew says, what good is it? He says, well, first of all, the primary good, and in verse 2 he says, he says, first of all, and, and when he says that, you're, you're waiting for him to say, and second, and third, and fourth, and he doesn't list out second, and third, and fourth until Romans chapter 9. But what, when he says, first of all, he says, this is first, this is primary. Above other things, the reason that you're benefited by being a Jew is that you have, you have been entrusted with the oracles of God. Now, what is, what is an oracle? Well, I had to look it up, so I went to, can, can you put it up there? I went to dictionary dot, or Merriam-Webster online, and here's their definition. Zoom in on that a little bit, will you? Can you zoom in? Okay. Here's the definition of an oracle. An oracle is a person, such as a priestess in ancient Greece, through whom a deity is believed to speak. So the best example is the prophecies that were given in the Delphic Oracle. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, an oracle is also a shrine in which a deity reveals hidden knowledge 
or the divine purpose for such, uh, through such a person. It's also an answer or decision given by an oracle. So it's either a person or it's a place you go to get the answer or it's the answer itself. It's, it's the information. Or it's a person giving wise or authoritative, authoritative decisions or opinions, an authoritative or wise expert an answer. Those are the dictionary definitions. In the ancient world, if you wanted to know what the gods thought, you would go to the pagan temples and you would seek out a priestess who worked in the pagan temple who would give you uh, the message from the gods. In fact, there's a, we got a picture, I think. This is, this is the ruins of the oracle at Delphi, which is in Greece. Uh, this is what's left of it, but this was the, the temple of Apollo, and it's where uh, the, 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 the head priestess was called, let me get this right, it was called the uh, Pythia. The head priestess, the Pythia, was the woman you would go to if you needed to know what does Apollo think we should do? What is Apollo's wisdom? How, how do we please Apollo? So you would go to the or to Delphi, you would go into the woman, she's the oracle, you would ask her the question, and then she would, wait, wait, go to the next picture. Here, here's an artist rendering of what's happening. People coming in, she would sit down in the chair, and you see that cloud of smoke around her. It is thought that that cloud of smoke may have in fact been cannabis. So she would use her cloud of smoke to try to commune with the gods, and what she would come up with, what she would come out with was the message. Oftentimes it was cryptic, or it was, uh, sometimes it was spastic. She would go into a, 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 a euphoric kind of a state, and she would just whirl around, and she would say things, and they thought she was communing with Apollo, and she was giving you insight. Now, sometimes her answers turned out to be true, which led people to think she really has it. Right? Like modern-day fortune tellers who can tell you something and you think, oh, they've, they've really got it. Now, let me just parenthetically say here, just because somebody is right some of the time doesn't mean that they've got divine revelation going on. Okay? In fact, you've all heard that a broken clock is right twice a day, right? I heard a story this week about a guy who his job at the factory was at 4 o'clock every day. He was supposed to blow the whistle to let everybody know that things were over. And he had a watch that was not a very good watch, so he would stop by the local clock store, and there was a clock in the window of the store, and every day he would set his watch with the time in the clock window. And he would go, and then he would pull the, the factory cord at 4 o'clock. One day, the owner of the clock store came out and said, I see you stopping by here every day. What, every day. What are you doing? And he said, well, I'm synchronizing my watch with the clock that's in the window. And the guy said, well, I, I hate to tell you this, but the clock in the window is not a very good clock. He said, I have to synchronize it every day. And he said, how do you synchronize it? He says, I synchronize it with the factory whistle at 4 o'clock. Just because somebody can give you the right answer once or twice doesn't mean that it's the right answer. So the Pythian princess, the, the prophetess, the Pythian prophetess would, uh, th th this practice started about seven centuries before Jesus was born, about the time of Isaiah in ancient Greece, and it continued until about four centuries after Jesus had been resurrected. And th it is said that the Oracle of Delphi was considered the most powerful woman in the world at that point. People would go to her seeking the word of God. Paul says it's great advantage for the Jew to be born a Jew because they don't have Pythian prophetesses. They have been given the word of the living God. Through the law and the prophets, they have the revelation, the wisdom of God that no other nation has. If you grew up in any other part of the of the ancient world, you sought Pythian princesses or prophetesses. You didn't seek. You you had your own mythology. The Jews had the actual revelation of the one true living God. In fact, the writer of Hebrews at the beginning of Hebrews talks about this. He says, "Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets." 
But in these last days he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed as heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He said, here's how we have known the mind of God. God spoke to us through our prophets. It's written down. We have the revelation of God. Paul is affirming in the ancient world that out of all the people around the world, the Jews alone have the authentic revelation of God in the law and the prophets. That gives them an advantage. Now you may ask, well, if you're not saved, if you're not rescued by God, how does having his word give you an advantage? Well, let me, let me explain it this way. And let me be clear as, as we start this. The United States of America is not a Christian nation. You will hear people sometimes say, we live in a Christian nation. It's pretty clear if you look around at our world today, if this is a Christian nation, then either something wrong with Christianity or we're not living it out very well. But the founders of our country did, in fact, were, in fact, influenced by and informed by the scriptures as they created our form of government. So when they started off with principles like we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created, men and women are created, with equality. Well, where'd they get that idea? Well, they read Genesis. They read that men and women are created and that men and women are created equal in God's sight. They're created with value and dignity. They're image bearers of God. They're endowed by their creator with certain rights. Where did they get that idea? Because the Bible says these things. So our nation, the governing of our nation, the freedoms we enjoy in this country are because we grew up in a nation that was influenced by the Bible. It's better to grow up in this nation influenced by the Bible than it is to grow up in another nation that's been influenced by pagan thinking. So there's benefit to growing up with the revelation of God whether that ever leads you to salvation or not. Now let me just stop for a second. You hear what I'm saying? The book you got in your hand, the book we're looking at this morning, this is the oracle. You have in your hand the mind of God, the will of God, the revelation of God. He has spoken, and we have every word that has proceeded out of his mouth that is profitable for us to have. We have a remarkable treasure in our laps that there are people in parts of the world they would love to have a scrap of what you have and yet we have it and we treat it casually two years ago the literary world was a buzz when a book was released Harper Collins Publishers came out with a never before released novel that had been written in 1957 and the book sold 1.1 million copies in its first week anybody know what book it was? was Harper Lee's Ghost at a Watchman, which was the prequel. Actually, it was the first draft of what became To Kill a Mockingbird. It was her first draft. She had submitted it to some publishers. They had said, there's some, there's some good stuff here, but it's rough. They sent it back to her. Nobody wanted to publish it back then. She reworked it into To Kill a Mockingbird. But now, in 2015... They said, we're going to release this never-before-released thing, and 1.1 million people went out and bought it. Why did they buy it? And, and by the way, literary geeks poured over it because they so loved the novel To Kill a Mockingbird, they wanted to know what was in the mind and the heart of Harper Lee. They wanted to understand where did her great story come from, what, what led us to this magnificent work of literature. You have in your hands the mind and the heart of God and pouring into it will give you insight into everything about him. What a gift. What a neglected gift. So here's the first question. Is there advantage in being a Jew? Yes, but it's not the advantage you were thinking. The advantage in being a Jew primarily is that you've been given the revelation of God, the oracle of God. Here's the second question. Paul, what if some were unfaithful 
And by unfaithful, here's what they mean. Paul, some Jews, most of them, have rejected the Messiah. So you're saying that these Jews who rejected the Messiah have been unfaithful to God in their rejection. Paul, if that's true, does their faithlessness nullify the promises God has made? In other words, are you suggesting God won't keep his promises to us because some don't believe Jesus is the Messiah? That's at the heart of the question. Pretty good debate question. You're, you're calling, they're saying, Paul, you're calling into question the character and nature of God. If the gospel's true, Paul, doesn't that mean that the promises God made to Jews are now broken unless they trust the Messiah? And Paul's answer to that is the unfaithfulness demonstrated by God's people when they rejected the Messiah does not in any way diminish the covenant faithfulness of God. Here's how he makes the argument, very simply, very forcefully. Verse 4, he begins with a very familiar phrase. He's going to use this phrase ten times in the book of Romans, and the phrase is meganoita. That's the, that's the Greek, meganoita. We translate it, in, in your Bible, does it say, may it never be? Is that what you got? Here are some of the ways it's translated. God forbid, of course not. By no means, away with the notion, perish the thought. The literal is really, this, sh this thought should not exist, or this thought should never have come to be. So Paul, are you saying that if Jews are unfaithful, God's going to break his promises to them? That thought should never exist, Paul says. That shouldn't even pop into your head. Don't even think that. The idea that someone would suggest that God might be unfaithful or unrighteous is unthinkable at best and blasphemy at worst. And he quotes from Psalm 51 in his response. It could be paraphrased this way. If you look at the facts and they lead you to the conclusion that God has been unfaithful, you have either misunderstood the facts or there is data you don't have. And by the way, that's true for us. When, when you look around and you say, why would God allow this? Why does God do this? How can God be loving and allow this to happen? Either there's data you don't have or you've misunderstood the facts as they are because God is all-powerful and is all-loving and what comes to be is, is from his hand and the fact that we look at it and go, that doesn't seem right to us doesn't mean that we know better than God. It just means we don't have all the facts. Some, somebody has said, if you knew what God knows, and if you saw what God sees, you would do what God does. And when you look at something and go, that doesn't make sense to me, that doesn't mean that God is unjust. It just means it doesn't make sense to you. God doesn't break promises. He doesn't walk back on a covenant. In fact, <clears throat> you've all heard people say, there's nothing God can't do. Well, there are some things God can't do. God can't break his promises. God can't tell a lie. It is not in his nature to do either of those things. If every person in the world was to come forward and bear witness to the fact that God broke his promise, that would mean every person in the world is lying. And God is still true. That's what Paul says when he says, let God be true and every man a liar. If everybody stands up and says, I don't think God was faithful here then everybody who stands up and says that is lying and God is still faithful. Now, that might lead you to a question today, a little theological bunny trail we're going to run here. The question is, God did make promises to Israel and some of those don't look like they've been kept. So how do we answer that? Well, Jim just gave the first answer. The first answer is, not yet. Time has not run out. The fact that God has not kept a promise until this point doesn't mean that he won't keep it. God is not slow, Peter says, in keeping his promises, as some count slowness. God is patient with his promises. He knows the perfect time to fulfill them. He promised the Messiah in the Garden of Eden. He delivered on the Messiah thousands of years later in the right time, in the perfect time. He will keep his promises in the perfect time. That's one answer when you say, well, it doesn't look like God kept his promises to the nation of Israel. Not yet. Here's a second answer. 
maybe some of these promises that God has made involve metaphors or word pictures and should not be understood literally. Maybe when we say God didn't keep his promises here, you're interpreting the promise too literally. Let me give you an example of this. There's a promise in Isaiah chapter 2 that a day is coming when God will draw all the people to Zion and there will be no more war and it says, you're familiar with this, it says he will beat their swords into plowshares. Okay, now if we're going to understand that literally, here's what that means. There's coming a day when God will bring the whole world to Jerusalem, that's Zion, and that we will all have swords and somehow those will be beaten into plowshares. The fact that we don't use swords or plowshares anymore seems inconsequential to that. Now, what I would say to you is that promise is metaphorical. God's going to draw all people to Zion. Zion is a picture of himself. It doesn't mean all people are coming to Jerusalem. He's going to draw all people to his holy hill, his holy mountain, to himself. And beating their swords into plowshares is simply a metaphor for the fact that we're not going to fight each other anymore. That promise will one day be fulfilled in the new kingdom. But I don't think it's going to be literally fulfilled. So, sometimes when we come to the promises of God and you say, I don't see God keeping that promise, maybe you just aren't understanding it the way it needs to be understood. Here's a third answer to the question. Some of the promises that God made for his children, he is keeping for his children in the church. He made the promises. You say, well, he made those promises to Israel. Well, go back to the last chapter. Paul says, not all Israel is Israel. Not all Jews are real Jews. Only those who have been circumcised in the heart are real Jews, he says. So the promises God made to the Jews, did he make them to every ethnic Jew or to those who have been circumcised in the heart? And today, if your heart has been circumcised because you have given your life to Christ, then you are a spiritual descendant of Abraham more than somebody who is a physical descendant of Abraham is. You see the distinction. So some of the promises God made for his people are being kept for his people, the church. He made them for his people, Israel, but he's keeping those promises through. For, for, here's an example. God said to his people, I will never leave you or forsake you. Is that promise for Israel? Or is that promise for covenant Israel with all those with circumcised hearts? Jesus reiterated it to the church. So when you say, is God faithful to keep his promises, maybe, maybe the first answer is not yet. Maybe the second answer is it's, you, you need to better understand what keeping it's going to mean. And maybe a third answer is God's going to keep it through the church. Now, when you try to figure out which of those promises are to be understood which way, that's when the theological fun begins, Okay. That's when theologians get together and they go back and forth and we have what's called covenant theology and we have what's called new covenant theology and we have what's called uh, dispensational theology and they all will go round and round about I think God's going to do this and I think the future is going to look like this and I think God's promises will be kept in this way. So there are some people who are expecting that when the Messiah returns, his feet will touch the ground in Israel and the Jewish sacrificial system will be reestablished for a thousand years because they say that's what God promised. Other people say, no, we shouldn't understand that literally. That's a figurative, and we need to interpret it differently. And by the way, there are good people on on both sides of that. And if you want to know which I believe, it's whatever person I read most recently who made a compelling argument. That's what I believe, okay? Because this is tricky, hard-to-understand stuff. But here's the point of all of it. God's promises are true and inviolable. And if you look around and say, I don't know that God kept his word here, it's just your understanding of his word that's the issue. So, two objections so far. The first is, is not there is there an advantage in being a, a Jew? Yes. Is God faithful to keep his promises? Yes. Here's the third objection. If the chief end of man is to glorify God, as the Westminster Catechism says, how can God punish someone if their disobedience ultimately brings glory to God? 
He says it this way in verse 5. If our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what should we say? Is God unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? And then notice he says, I speak in a human way. He says, I know this sounds a little crazy, but bear with me for the moment because this is, this is what I'm hearing people say. I'm embarrassed to even make the argument, he says. And then his response again is another meganointa. May it never be. Don't even entertain the thought that your unrighteousness somehow is a good thing because God gets glory when you're unrighteous. Now here's an example of the logic that the opponents of Paul are using here. They're saying, you know, Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus, right? When Judas betrayed Jesus, that set in motion the events that led to Jesus being crucified and that set in motion the events that led to Jesus being resurrected from the dead. The crucifixion and the resurrection are good things. In fact, Paul, you say they're the central things. They're at the heart of everything you believe. Judas got that whole thing going when he betrayed Jesus. Therefore, God should give Judas the Medal of Honor, not condemn him for his betrayal. How God would never have gotten the glory he got through, the, through what happened with uh, Jesus if it hadn't been for Judas. That's the argument. Paul says, well, if you stick with that line of reasoning, you're going to run into problems. Because God gets glory for himself in all human circumstances. So if he gets glory for himself in all human circumstances, he's never going to be able to judge anyone for anything because everything gives him glory. That's Paul's, when he says, how will ju God judge the world? He said, if everything that brings glory to God is off limits, God can't judge the world. So what happens? Follow me here. What happens when we sin? One of two things happens. When you sin, God either extends grace to you because you are his child and because Christ has borne the penalty for your sin. So God gives you grace. He overlooks. He does not remember your sin any longer. He forgives it. You are healed. You are his child. Jesus paid for your sin. It's forgiven. Either that or if you're not a follower of Jesus, God looks at your sin and because you've never trusted in the work of Christ on the cross, God will one day punish you for your sin. One of two choices, grace or punishment. If God gives you grace, he gets glory for himself, doesn't he? I mean, the very fact that he would extend grace to sinners, you, you look at that and you go, he is a marvelous God. He is an amazing God. The fact that I am a recipient of God's grace is just a testimony to how wonderful he is. He gets glory when we get grace. When God will one day punish sin, he will get glory in that moment because it will prove that he is a righteous and just God who keeps his word. So either way, whether you get grace or you get punishment in those moments, God will get glory. So Paul says if your argument is that God can't punish somebody if his actions will ultimately bring God glory, then God can't punish anybody because everything's going to bring him glory. And he restates the argument in verse 7. And he says, Here, if, if hypothetically, if, if, my, if, if through my hypothetical lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come, as some people have slandered me with saying, slanderously charged us with saying. Paul was being accused of being what's called an antinomian. Anti means against, nomian means law. They were saying Paul is against the law. He's telling people, you don't have to keep the law. You don't have to obey God. You can live however you want, and God's going to give you grace. That's antinomianism. And he says, that's a slanderous charge against me. I'm not saying that. But these people are saying, all, what Paul's saying is go ahead and live it up because God's going to get glory if you do. This time, he doesn't even answer the objection. Look at how he ends the verse 8. He says, people who make an argument like that, their condemnation is just. I'm not even going to answer that. It's just, it's obvious that if that's how you're thinking, God's, God's condemnation of you is right and fair. It's just. Now, there aren't a lot of people in our day that try to make the argument that if we sin, God gets more glory. But there are a lot of people in our day who make the argument that, well, if I sin, God, God gives grace. Right? 
they minimize, they trivialize their sin by simply saying, well, it's all grace. I'm under grace. Rather than feeling the weight of their sin and recognizing that God's grace did not come cheap. There is a great cost that was paid for God to extend grace to you. God does not simply wave away sin. The cost that was paid is something that we remind ourselves of every week as we come here to worship. The elements on this table are pictures of the cost. There's a picture of a broken body and shed blood up here. It's a good thing it's a picture. I mean, imagine, I've I've never been to a crime scene where a murder was committed, but you've seen them in movies or on television. You walk up and you see broken bodies and you see shed blood. And what do we do when we see that? We turn away. God said, I'm going to leave pictures for you, bread and juice, to remind you of the cost that was paid so that grace could be yours, so that you could experience grace. And so each week here at Redeemer, what we do is we come and we take the bread and we take the juice and we, in those moments of contemplating the cross and the resurrection, we receive grace from God as we take and eat and remind ourselves of the price that was paid. If if you're a visitor with us, we want you to know we practice what's called open communion. Open communion means anybody who is here who can say, I love Jesus, I've given my life to him, I'm a follower of Christ, this table is open for you. It's, It's your conscience that determines whether you should come to the table. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, You're not a a follower of Christ. Rather than coming to the table, you ought to just stop and consider what you've heard here this morning and think, what about my life? If you're here this morning and you're a believer and you are, if there's an ongoing pattern of unrepentant sin in your life, that's something you ought to confront before you come to the table. Are you ready to turn away from that sin? Are you ready to get help with that issue in your life? Or do you just keep minimizing it and saying, oh, well, God will forgive me? If if you're ready to get help, as a church, we want to help. Not because we have all the answers, but because we are fellow strugglers who have found help for our own souls, and we need one another to help ourselves with these issues. So if you're here this morning and you, you know and love Christ, you're welcome at the table. If you're here and you don't know Christ, consider what we've said and if you're here this morning and there is an ongoing pattern of what's called a besetting sin a sin that just you 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 can't get shaken loose in your life and you need help with that coming to the table means i am i'm ready to turn from that and get the help i need i don't want that sin to dominate my life anymore and if that is your heart then come you uh Take some time to pray, think about these things, contemplate that. I'm going to prepare the table, and in just a minute I'll call you to the table. We'll come down the outer aisles to receive the bread and the juice. Take the bread and the juice back to your seat, and we'll take them together. There's juice uh, on the outside. There's wine in the middle for those who would prefer wine, and there is there are gluten-free, uh, gluten-free bread up here as well. You prepare your hearts while I prepare the table.
these pictures that God has given us are pictures of the most significant moment in all of human history, the moment that is the most significant for each of our lives. On the night before Jesus was crucified, he was having the Passover meal with his disciples, and in the midst of that meal, he took bread, he prayed a prayer of blessing, and then he broke the bread, then he passed it. He said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And then he said, as often as you eat this, remember me. And so, Lord Jesus, this morning, that's what we're doing. We are remembering the great cost that you paid, not just in the physical torment, your broken body, but in the spiritual torture of being separated from the Father. Lord, we thank you that you have made a new and living way for us to come to faith through your shed blood and through your broken body. We receive this now with grateful hearts as we feast on Christ in our hearts. Amen. When the meal was over, Jesus took the cup and he prayed a prayer of blessing for it. And then he passed it and he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the remission of your sins. As often as you drink this, remember me. And again, Lord Jesus, we do remember that nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. The blood of bulls and goats were temporary signs that pointed us to the one true and perfect sacrifice. You are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we now feast on Christ in our hearts as we receive this with grateful hearts. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing the last verse of uh, Grace Greater Than All of Our Sin, Marvelous, Infinite, Matchless Grace, and then I'll dismiss us with a benediction. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace be bestowed on all who believe you that are longing to see will you this moment his grace receive sing the chorus grace this blessing from God with open hands and open hearts. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Abide in peace. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you back on Mother's Day next Sunday. If you are a guest here with us this morning, Please stop at the uh, information table. We have a gift for you. Guests, stop by and get your gift.